that. Okay, so uh, to quickly revise what we have done in the previous class, we have seen that what the process of photosynthesis is, right, under the autotrophic nutrition. Then we uh, have also seen the various, like how the tomato uh, opening and closing is regulated, right, with the help of guard cells. Now, yes, this part I have, uh, have I done, like from where the minerals are taken in. Yes, ma'am, it's also done. All right. So today we're going to start with the heterotrophic mode of nutrition. Now see, heterotrophic mode of nutrition in this type, the organisms cannot synthesize their own food and they are dependent on the other organisms. Under the heterotrophic mode of nutrition comes saprophytic, parasitic and decomposer. Now, saprophytes or saprophytic mode and decomposer are almost the same thing because they feed on the dead and decaying organic matter. So they convert the complex organic substances into the simpler ones and that is saprophytic and that is the same for decomposers as well. Okay? Okay, ma'am. Yeah. What, what are they doing? All those organic matter, like for example, all those organisms that have been dead. Now the saprophytes will feed on them, the dead organic matter the ones that are decaying in the soil they will feed on them then there is parasitic mode of nutrition now what is a parasite any kind of organism that harms the other organism there are two types of organism there is a parasite and then there is a host now parasite can be present on the host or it can be present in the host both the conditions can be there and it will harm the host, meaning it derives its nutrition from the host organs. Okay? So, talking about parasitic, uh, the parasitic mode of nutrition, it can be of two types. Like the parasites can be of two types. Endoparasite, when they are present inside the body of the host. Ecto, endo means inside. So, endoparasite, the parasite which is present inside. Then there is ectoparasite. Meaning on the parasite that is present on the body is ectoparasite. Now to see the examples, we have endoparasite that is virus and worms. Right? Viruses infect us from the inside. So we get sometimes like runny nose, cold. Right? There are so many viral diseases. So the virus infects us from the inside. Then the worms also. Talking about the ectoparasite. So these are the parasites that are present on the body. Such as leeches, like leeches, when they like attach to the body, they suck blood, right? So leeches, yes, ticks and lice, like ticks and lice is mostly present on animals, right? So they are ectoparasite, present on the body of the host. Now, if, for example, leeches are attached to human body, so the human will be the host, the leech will be the parasite, okay? And if the virus is present inside the human body, then again, the human is the host. The virus is the parasite. Clear? Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay. Mm. The student who has joined now, kindly switch on your video. <clears throat> ma'am, my camera isn't working. It's not working? Yes, ma'am. You can at least try to switch on the video. Nobody else can see you. Only I can see you. No one can see your video. Only I can see your video. Nor will it get recorded. Only my video gets recorded. So you can feel comfortable and you can switch on your video. Because you know when you switch on your video, I can see you. So I can teach better. I can understand that if you are understanding or not. Okay. That's why I asked to switch on the video. Try to switch on. Maybe it will work. I'm trying ma'am. It's not. It's not working? Yes ma'am. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, up until now, we have seen the three different modes that come under the heterotrophic mode of nutrition. Now, when we are talking about the saprophytic, the example is fungi, the fungus. The fungus is saprophytic and it is also a decomposer. And under the decomposer, there is earthworm as well. And you must remember one thing that the earthworm is most commonly known as the farmer's friend. Because what happens that since earthworm is present in the soil, and it 
you know feeds on the dead and decaying organic matter so what it does is that it feeds on the decaying matter and it makes the nutrients available in the soil because of which the crops that are growing they will be very good so that is why the earthworm being a decomposer is known as most commonly as the farmer's friend here yes ma'am now <clears throat> okay now see i have told you that um, all the plants are autotrophic right they make their own food but then again there are some exceptions there are some parasitic plants also such as cascuta commonly known as amar bale it is a parasitic plant it does not make its own food it is a it is present as a parasite on another plant okay and apart from that have you people ever heard about venus flytrap the plant that yes. looks like this whenever an insect sits it's like closes oh yes ma'am yeah that is a heterotrophic plant despite of being plant it does not photosynthesize because it, it is heterotrophic then you might have also heard about uh, this thing uh, pitcher plant bladder wort all of these plants are heterotrophic they cannot uh, make their own food now talking about the other modes of nutrition there is amoeba amoeba is a is an organism that procures the food like takes in the food with the help of pseudopodia pseudopodia means false feet pseudo means false podia is feet so false feet now what it does is that this is this is how the amoeba looks like okay now whenever a food comes in its like vicinity whenever a food particle is near then what it does it draws out its false feet like this and what it does is like it sort of draws it like this and takes the food inside makes a food vacuum so this is how amoeba procures its nutrition again it's not making its own food so this is also heterotrophic then there is another organism that is paramecium now the body of paramecium it is whole entire line so uh, this thing covered by cilia tiny hair like projection like how i have drawn here the cilia help the paramecium to get the food again since it is not making its food it is again heterotrophic clear so ma'am paramecium is a virus like hmm ma'am it is a virus like like no 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 it's not a virus no it is it is a protozoa okay it is a different organism it's not a virus okay okay so these are the heterotrophic modes of nutrition now we'll discuss about the nutrition in the case of humans now the things that we can relate now our nutrition is known as holozoic mode of nutrition holozoic why is it holozoic is because what we do is that we take in the food as whole and then we digest it in our body and then we get the energy from it this type of mode of nutrition is holozoic mode of nutrition okay now in our like nutrition there are five basic stages that happen first is ingestion we take in the food that is ingestion then we chew it and then digestion we digest the food now when the food has been digested we the energy which is there in the food that energy is absorbed by the body and then when the energy has been absorbed that energy gets distributed to different cells in our body and that is assimilation then the undigested substances are excreted out and that is ingestion so five steps are there in the nutrition of humans ingestion digestion absorption assimilation and ingestion clear hmm yes ma'am all right <clears throat> moving forward talking about now see as humans we have been blessed with a digestive system we have a very proper digestive system in our body which contains multiple like digestive glands are there and the alimentary canal is there now what is alimentary canal now alimentary canal is the canal which starts from the mouth ends at the anus okay that is the alimentary canal of human beings now the 
uh, the, the glands that are present in the digestive system, we'll call them as the digestive glands. Now, what are those? The three main liver, pancreas and salivary glands. Okay, liver, pancreas and salivary glands. Now, you must remember one more thing that liver is the largest gland in our body. Always remember this. Okay. The largest gland in human body is liver. And ma'am, it is also small intestine. No, small intestine is the organ, the site of complete digestion. It's not a gland. Okay, small intestine is, an, is a digestive organ, but it's not a gland. Liver is oh. a gland, pancreas is a gland, and salivary glands are gland. Now, okay. what happens? We start, we take the food, we put it in our mouth, right? Now, in our mouth, we have teeth and we have tongue, right? And salivary gland is present in our mouth only. Now, we start chewing our food so that we can reduce the size of the food so that we can swallow it. <clears throat> now, saliva is an enzyme which is secreted by these salivary glands. It has two functions. Okay. First is that it helps in moistening the food. It wets the food so that it can be easily swallowed. Apart from that, when we are chewing, see our food has so many components. It has carbohydrates, proteins, fat, vitamins. So many things are there in our food. Now, the carbohydrate part. Okay. What it does is that like saliva is produced in a mouth, that saliva contains an enzyme which is known as salivary amylase. Now what happens is that when the saliva has been released, it contains salivary amylase. Now this salivary amylase is responsible for the digestion of carbohydrates. 30% of the total carbohydrates gets digested in the mouth only. 30%, always remember this number, 30% of the carbohydrates, it gets digested in the mouth. Now, after that has been done, then we swallow it, right? We push the food into the food pipe. Now, the food pipe is known as the esophagus. Now, when the food goes into the food pipe, it travels down to the stomach. Now, how does that happen? See, the esophagus moves sort of like contracts and relax, contracts and relax, because of which the food is pushed down. And this contraction and relaxation movement is known as peristalsis movement. Okay, this movement through which the food is pushed down. Now, after the food is pushed down, it goes into the stomach. That is a large J-shaped storage structure. It stores the food. And also digests the food. Now, the walls of the stomach release certain chemicals. Okay, what are they? The first thing that has been released is the hydrochloric acid. The strongest acid, right? Hydrochloric acid. Secondly, the enzyme that is known as pepsin. And thirdly, mucus is released. Each of those have their own different function. Talking about the hydrochloric acid. What it does is that since it is an acid, so in the stomach, it creates an acidic medium, first of all, okay? Secondly, what it does is that it physically breaks down the food. Like it creates smaller particles, even smaller particles, so that digestion will be easier. Then there is pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that is responsible for the digestion of protein. Like how amylase, salivary amylase was digesting the carbohydrate. Same way, the pepsin will digest the protein. Now, isn't it really astonishing to think that, okay, hydrochloric acid, you know, hydrochloric acid, if we, if we go into the lab and if we touch hydrochloric acid with our bare hand, our skin will be burned. Our skin will burn when we touch hydrochloric acid and it is present in our stomach. How are we living? Isn't it so impossible, right? Why? How can we live if we have such a, uh, you know, you can say strong acid in our body? There is a reason. This mucus, mucus is a sticky substance, mucus. Now, our wall of stomach, the whole entire wall, the inside of the stomach 
is actually protected with this mucus layer. Okay, it is present like for example, if this is the stomach, then this whole entire inner portion will be present, like mucus will be present so that the HCl, the hydrochloric acid, so that it does not act on the wall of the stomach. Clear? That is why these three things are there. Clear? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so hydrochloric acid, pepsin and mucus are released by the walls of the stomach. Clear? No. Yes. From the stomach, the food is now released into the small intestine. Now, the small, this release actually, see, whenever one thing, like the food is going from one organ to another, it, it sort of has to have a regulatory pathway, a gate, isn't it? Whenever we move from one room to another room, there is a door. We have to open that door and then we get inside, isn't it? Same thing happens here also. Whenever, like for example, let's just consider stomach as room one and small intestine as room two. So when we want to enter the room two from room one, then we have to open the door and then only we can get in. That door activity is performed by a sphincter muscle. A muscle will, is there that regulates, like if, when it will open, then the food will go into the small intestine and then it closes so that the food does not go back. Okay, so that is why the sphincter muscle is there. Clear? Yes, ma'am. All right. Now, uh, this actually the release of the food from the stomach to the small intestine is actually regulated by this sphincter muscle. Now, this small intestine is the largest part of the alimentary canal. It is the site of 100% digestion. Like the complete digestion happens here. Every single thing happens. Like every single thing gets digested in the small intestine. All right, and, and we see in the diagram of digestive system, why is the small intestine like this? Why is it not straight? Why is it convoluted? Why is it so topsy-turvy? Tell me, what do you think? Ma'am, to increase the surface area. That's right, to increase the surface area. And another thing is that, since it is a really long organ, so we are not that tall, right? So things have to fit inside us. That is why it has been folded and put inside us. Because it is really long, so it is like that. Okay? And yes, 100% it increases the surface area. Now the length of the small intestine varies. Okay? The length of the small intestine depends upon the type of organ. For example, if we are talking about the herbivores, the the organisms that just eat the plants, right? The grasses and everything. So they would need a longer small intestine so as to digest the grass. Why? Because the grass contains, like the grass has cellulose in it. So it takes a longer time to digest cellulose. This is the reason why herbivores, all those plant eaters, organisms, those will have a longer small intestine. Talking about the carnivores, so carnivores need a smaller, small intestine because they are not eating grass, they're eating meat and it is easier to digest meat as compared to grass. So the carnivores would require smaller, small intestine and the herbivores would require a larger, small intestine. Clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay, moving forward. The small intestine is the site of complete digestion of food. 100% digestion takes place here. Meaning of carbohydrates, proteins, fat, everything gets digested here. Now this small intestine receives the secretions from the liver, which is the largest gland of our body. So the liver secretes the enzyme and the pancreas, which secretes the enzyme, both of these enzymes are received by the small intestine. Since small intestine is the site of complete digestion, so all the enzymes that are required will be sent here only, isn't it? Yes. Now, what happens is that now in our stomach, there was hydrochloric acid. And the hydrochloric acid, since it is an acid and it creates an acidic medium. So the food which comes from the stomach is acidic. Hmm? So the yes. pancreatic enzyme 
acts on this acidic food to make it basic, to make it alkaline in nature. Okay, the first thing that the pancreatic enzyme does. Now, okay. the liver, the largest gland of our body, the liver, it secretes bile juice. Okay, what is the secretion of liver? Bile juice. Bile juice. Okay. Yes. Now, what is, the, what is the function of bile juice? It, the function of bile juice is to emulsify the fat. Now, whatever fat molecule is there in our food, emulsification process, meaning breakdown, like breakdown, putting it into pieces. So, the bile juice breaks down the food or the fat molecules into smaller structures. Like the, if this was a huge fat globule, it will be broken down into smaller flat, fat All right. Now, the pancreatic juice from the pancreas, it contains the enzymes such as trypsin, which is there for the digestion of protein. Enzyme lipase, which is there to digest the emulsified fats, meaning the fat that has been broken down by the bile juice initially. Now, those smaller pieces will be digested by lipase. Clear? Yes. Now, Apart from uh, the secretion from the pancreas and the secretion from the bile, the wall of the small intestine also secretes the enzyme that is known as intestinal juice. The, just like how stomach was, wall was secreting the enzyme, same way the small intestine wall will also secrete and that we will call as intestinal juice. Now, this intestinal juice, what it does is that it will convert the protein into amino acid, the complex carbohydrates into glucose, the fat into fatty acid and glycerol, meaning even smaller structures, meaning these are the forms in which our body can absorb it. Clear? Yes. Yes. Now, the small intestine, it is the site of complete digestion, meaning everything happens here. Now, inside the small intestine, there is like tiny finger-like projection all over that is known as villi. Now, villi also increases the surface area for absorption, meaning, see, after the food has been digested, then it has to be absorbed. Now, this villi helps in that absorption process. Okay? Yes. Yes. So, the villi are richly supplied with blood vessels. Now, ultimately, whatever energy and whatever molecules that are there after digestion, it has to be sent into the blood stream. Okay, blood. Blood has to absorb it. So, that is why the villi are richly supplied with blood vessels, meaning the digested food now directly can be absorbed by the villi, which is present in the small intestine. Now, the reason why we absorb the digested food is to get energy, obviously, to build new tissues, to repair the old tissues, right? We do all of these things so that we can get energy and we can do our body's work, right? Yes. So, this is the whole entire process of digestion and absorption. Any doubts up till now? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I have one question. Tell me. In our whole entire elementary canal, okay, for digestion in humans, where does the digestion begin? Ma'am, from the stomach. Think first. Think and answer. Where does the digestion begin? It's not the oh, stomach. Small intestine. No. No. no, small intestine comes last. So how can it begin there? So from mouth to yeah, why mouth? <clears throat> Mom, oh, yes, because it secretes the salivary glands. So it like wets the Correct. food. And it, salivary okay. amylase, the enzyme salivary amylase is secreted there. And as I told you, 30% of carbohydrate digested in the mouth only. So the digestion process starts in the mouth. Only. Okay? Okay, now. Yes. Now, the food that has not been digested, it moves into the large intestine. Okay? Good. Undigested food moves into the large intestine and 
here what happens? The excessive water and all minerals and vitamins, everything gets absorbed in the small intestine. Okay. okay. Water, minerals, vitamins gets absorbed in large intestine. Now, after this, whatever uh, food has been left, the one that is undigested, now it will be like uh, defecated, excreted out of our body and that is known as ejection. E now, ejection takes place ejection takes place by anus and this again, since it is one organ connected with another, so the it is regulated, the ejection process is regulated by the anal sphincter. Okay? Okay. Any doubts up, up till now? No, ma'am. So this is the whole entire process of digestion. So we have completed one life process of human beings. That is digestion part. Do you have any doubts up till now? No, ma'am. Okay. Now you people can note down. Take the notes nicely. <clears throat> and if you have any doubts, ask.
Ma'am, could you scroll down? Both of you are done writing up till now? Oh, uh, yes, ma'am, done. Yes, ma'am.
Done, ma'am. Both of you are done? Done, ma'am.
Done, ma'am.